Hello and welcome to our monthly meeting of the Central Banking and Digital Currency Series. Before we start, I would like to advertise two upcoming events. First, next week on October 6th, there will be a webinar co-organized with the CEPR on digital money and um, finance. Uh, I will post the registration link in the chat box. And then at the end of the month, on the 28th, we will host a job market candidate virtual workshop featuring four job market candidate presentations. Hope you will join us and meet the junior researchers working on central banking and digital currencies. And for today, our moderator is Thomas Moser, who is an alternate member of the governing board of the Swiss National Bank. I will now turn things over to Thomas. Thank you very much, uh, Jonathan. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation to moderate this interesting panel. So let me first uh, do some housekeeping. The way it works, the presenter has 25 minutes uh, and then the discussion usually has 10 minutes. We said we may be doing 15 minutes for Cyril. He prepared a lot of comments. And then we will have a Q&A of uh, 20 minutes. And panelists can unmute themselves and ask the questions. All others can use the Q&A box and then we can, uh, I can select and read the questions uh, that you have. And uh, also note please that this session is being recorded and it will be posted on the website. Okay, then I think I can start Jonathan, is that okay? Yeah. Good, so the presenter, as you have seen, is uh, Hannah Halaburda. She is uh, an associate professor of technology operations and statistics at New York University Stern. She has before been uh, as an assistant professor at Harvard Business School. And uh, from my perspective, important, she has been at the Bank of Canada. So a former fellow central banker. And I also have to say that the, probably the first uh, economic analysis of cryptocurrencies that I have ever read was uh, Hannah's book that she published back in 2015, Beyond Bitcoin, the Economics of Digital Currency. So great to see that uh, she's still contributing to the field. And today she will uh, present uh, a paper that she co-authored called An Economic Model of Consensus uh, on Distributed Ledgers. So Hannah, let me turn over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for this uh, nice introduction. Let me uh, share my slides. Okay. Um, so uh, this is a uh, this is co-authored work um, with uh, Jigao He and uh, Jason Lee. And this work has been inspired by an observation that a lot of the uh, newer blockchains, blockchains post proof of work, are using uh, the so-called Byzantine fault tolerant, uh, tolerant protocols in their uh, consensus mechanisms. So this is true about the Ethereum using proof of stake, a hyperledger fabric for a while now, uh, tender mint uh, rebranded by uh, as Ignite, so the new, this new generation of blockchains is using this Byzantine fault tolerant, uh, the concept of Byzantine fault tolerance and Byzantine fault tolerant uh, consensus protocols. So why was this uh, you know, surprising or in any way pushing us to, to ask a question? Uh, this is because Byzantine fault tolerance is far older than blockchains. It goes back to the late 70s as a problem and early 80s as, as solutions. And this is a problem that originated in distributed databases. And uh, now, by now, very classic problem. It has many solutions, not just one, but a whole uh, like couple of classes of solutions. And we wouldn't be able to function, we wouldn't be able to see those large companies on the internet, like Facebook, Google, Amazon, or you know, even smaller ones, if we didn't have a good way to manage distributed databases and consensus on distributed databases. So the problem of, of consensus on distributed databases is that in distributed systems, there is a peer-to-peer -peer network that is uh, communicating and is sending messages. 
And this peer-to-peer -peer network keeps their own ledgers, their own databases that need to be updated in a, this, in a similar way. So as the messages are floating around in the peer-to-peer -peer network, they may be a little bit out of order. The really important part for distributed databases is that every node in a distributed database is keeping the same copy of the database. And as each one of them is updating their individual local copies, they all update it in the same way. So this is a far from a trivial problem. But we have methods to solve it. And one of the oldest, most reliable one is this Byzantine fault tolerant. Uh, just uh, you know, a, a short, a brief, uh, a brief, brief version, a brief, brief detour on the name. Byzantine uh, fault tolerant comes from the name comes from uh, a Byzantine generals problem. And Byzantine generals are trying to communicate and coordinate an attack and they basically need to be sending those messages to each other's so messages may be intercepted. So at which point they have each of those uh, Byzantine generals have the belief that everybody else is going to attack at the same time, just relying on this local knowledge. So this is, uh, this actually does the logic does play an important role. So like I said, it's an old problem. It had solutions. Uh, it was almost uh, relegated to a dusty corner of computer science departments, but uh, the interest in the problem is uh, was reignited by the uh, by the blockchains and the new generation of blockchains. So blockchains basically are distributed ledgers. I mean, they are distributed ledgers, which means that they are basically distributed databases, a special type of distributed databases, and. What we have learned from Byzantine fault tolerant protocols give us guidance to, des to design efficient and effective blockchain protocols to achieve consensus, right? There is, however, crucial difference, and this is why we were interested in this problem. There is a difference in advertiser, uh, adver uh, adver uh, adversary, <laughs> and there's a difference in how adversaries and how, uh, uh, how adversaries behave in, this, uh, in the two environments. So in both environments, we may have situations where somebody wants to subvert the system, somebody wants to uh, hack the, the nodes and make them do something else. But in traditional distributed uh, databases, while we expect that the, some nodes may be hacked and other nodes may fail, nodes that work properly they just follow the protocol as it is prescribed. And the crucial difference is that in blockchains, nodes who are not hacked and who did not fail, they are independent entities and they are individually pay of maximizing. And therefore, therefore, every node decides whether it is worth for them to follow the protocol or to deviate from the protocol. You can download Oh, Ethereum client, but then you can modify it. You don't need to run exactly the default version of the uh, of the software. So we need to think about economic incentives in analysis of uh, Byzantine fault tolerant consensus in the context of blockchains. So what type of protocols will be incentive compatible? Because now we need this incentive compatibility in order for the nodes to actually want to follow the protocol and therefore reach the consensus. So this is why we developed the economic model of Byzantine fault tolerant consensus, uh, where we characterize, um, uh, characterize our symmetric equilibria. And we show that not every design that achieves consensus, achieves consensus in the, um, in the distributed database uh, will achieve consensus in the presence of rational agents who are individually pay of maximizing to decide whether they want to follow the protocol or not. And because now we need to think about the, uh, the incentives of the nodes, the rational nodes, they need to be given some reward for achieving consensus and some punishment for not achieving consensus. The payoffs need to be there. And since the nodes need to be paid to be incentivized to reach consensus, it adds to the cost of running the system. So the cost of Running a system was always there, uh, you know, even in distributed databases, the, the, the uh, servers take, um, take up uh, energy and, and so on, and we need to lay the cables. But really now we have the cost of incentives that are part of the architecture of the, uh, of the protocol, which has not been considered before. So incentives add to the cost of the system. So our uh, equilibrium analysis um, 
show uh, offers explanation on how to design a protocol and how uh, the design of the protocol affects the cost of the system and uh, which type of protocols will be cheaper, will achieve consensus cheaper than others. So uh, to give a kind of one example why it matters and why, why it's different uh, when we think about incentives is that traditional Byzantine fault tolerant protocols recommend that nodes always send and forward messages as frequently as they can or you know, with the highest probability that they can. Sometimes, however, messages get lost. So traditional prescription is, traditional protocols prescription is, even if you think that with some probability the message will get lost, you still send it every time you can, every time you get it. Um, we show that in the presence of message loss, when there's some probability of message loss, uh, and when to incentivize the, the nodes, it is maybe actually prohibitively, prohibitively costly to achieve reliable consensus if we ask the nodes to always send the message. So send a message even if it gets there with probability 99%. It turns out not to be as effective as asking the nodes to send the message only with probability one half. So sometimes you send, sometimes you don't according to a prescribed uh, probability. Okay, so this is an example of how economic analysis may change the prescription of the, uh, of the protocol. Uh, so, uh, like I said, the, uh, the Byzantine fault tolerant uh, protocols um, are a classic problem in computer science. So the first kind of reliable solution goes back to the 80s. And it is important to, you know, to think about the structure of the classic uh, uh, Byzantine fault tolerant protocol, which we will modify slightly. And the uh, important part is that we have this distributed network of computer nodes. It's a peer-to-peer -peer network, and they communicate with each other. There isn't one authoritative copy of a database that they can all refer to. The same way that we don't have the blockchain, we tend to talk about the blockchain, but there isn't the blockchain. There are just local copies of blockchains and the magic comes from the fact that they are all the same, uh, but only in equilibrium when it works. Right? So each of those computer nodes, they need to reach consensus based only on the local information. They don't know exactly what the other nodes are seeing, what messages they are seeing, but they need to infer and without this global knowledge, the local knowledge needs to lead to consensus. In, and they need to do it in the presence of Byzantine nodes. And Byzantine nodes are the, the ones that may behave arbitrarily. They may coordinate and try to attack together. They may have some other uh, objectives uh, or they may uh, be attacking independently. So we don't really know what they are doing, but even though they are there, we should be able to reach, uh, reach uh, consensus. So traditional Byzantine fault tolerant protocols stipulate honest strategies, so-called honest strategies for non-Byzantine nodes. So just following the protocol, we will be modifying that. And as I said, they are uh, very popularly used by all tech companies to maintain their databases. So in this paper, uh, we uh, acknowledge that blockchains live in, a, in trustless environments and they are run by those independent entities that are uh, individually pay off, uh, uh, pay off optimizing. And uh, therefore, on non Byzantine nodes in our model are rational rather than honest. And they will follow the protocol only if they will find it worthwhile. Uh, but also, they need to form uh, beliefs about what. Uh, what, what will be the behavior of Byzantine nodes. And here we are going to utilize the ambiguity aversion uh, about Byzantine, uh, Byzantine strategies. So because we don't know what Byzantine nodes objectives are, and we don't know what they are going to be doing, we're going to assume that uh, they will be doing whatever we think is the worst case scenario as a rational node. So in, this, the, in the context of this, this worst case scenario, we still need to reach equilibrium. Uh, we still need to reach consensus in equilibrium. So we are going to, the basis of our analysis is a simple consensus game, a simplified consensus game, where we have a continuum, uh, a continuum of computer nodes of measure N, and those nodes will be communicating. Uh, first, nature randomly selects one node as a leader, and all the other nodes then are called, called backups. And then the leader decides 
uh, whether to send a message, uh, it could be a new batch of transaction, the message we are going to attack at 3 a.m. Uh, and so on, um, whether to send this new message to other backup, uh, uh, backup nodes. The backup nodes who received the message uh, from the leader will uh, forward or decide whether to forward the message to other backup nodes. And for uh, at the end of this communication stage, each node, node looks at the messages that they have received and then decide based on the number of messages that they have received and from whom they receive those messages, they decide whether to commit a message uh, or to their local ledger or not. So whether to add the batch of uh, the new batch of transactions to their local ledger or not. And of course, they worry about whether other uh, other nodes are adding the same batch of transactions or not. Okay. So we reach consensus when everybody adds the same number, uh, the same batch of transactions. The problem is that we we have a measure f of Byzantine nodes who may take arbitrary actions, and the bigger problem is that we never know who which of the which of the computers are Byzantine nodes. If we knew who are the Byzantine nodes, we would just exclude them and we will ignore them. But we can't ignore them. So we know we are going to have those messages from Byzantine nodes floating around. So uh, for, the, uh, for the measure n minus f of rational nodes, uh, they are going to maximize the, their payoff. And, their, uh, and to maximize the payoff, it is important what are the payoffs. So if uh, a, a, a rational node commits a commits message to the, uh, to the ledger uh, and the consensus succeeds, then uh, the node receives a reward R, which is positive. But if a rational node commits message to the ledger and the uh, consensus fails, it means that now we are getting a fork and there is a penalty for, for those who committed this message of, uh, minus, uh, of minus C. Uh, if you did not commit the message, you get the benchmark zero, there is a, um, the, the blockchain is stalling. And we are going to say that the consensus succeeds if the measure n minus f, so almost all rational nodes, commit. So uh, with that, we are ending up with this dynamic game of imperfect, uh, uh, imperfect information that has flavors of both coordination, because I want to commit if and only if everybody else commits, and cheap talk of the communication stage, uh, which we solve uh, for perfect Bayesian equilibrium with, with multipliers over Byzantine strategies. And the multiplier priors over Byzantine strategies come from this ambiguity aversion uh, assumption that uh, that we are making, and the the basic uh, the, the basic uh, logic behind it is that we don't know what Byzantine uh, Byzantine uh, nodes are doing, so let's assume that whatever they are doing is going to be worse for us. So we are going always going to think about the strategy of Byzantine nodes, which is going to be worse for our payoff. No, uh, depending on what we are doing. We give them this ability to always see what we're doing and respond uh, in the worst possible uh, way for us. So in this environment, uh, in order to characterize all symmetric equilibria, we start with, uh, uh, with considering a candidate symmetric equilibrium. So symmetric equilibrium will mean that we are going to assume that everybody, uh, uh, every node sends uh, a rational leader sends message to each backup with the same probability p, and rational backup, if they got a message, they will forward this message with probability q to everybody else, because it, in principle, those probabilities could be differential depending on the recipient. We're going to look at the symmetric equilibrium. Okay, so we have this p and q, and then based on the p, on this p and q, uh, the, uh, the backup collects the messages, and is going to commit only if receiving certain number of messages given the interval that we are going to characterize. So it may it is possible that the, uh, the backup node will want to commit uh, based on uh, give a, based on different number of messages if they also got a message from the leader. Then the the number of messages that they are getting if they didn't get one from the leader, and sometimes it will matter and sometimes it will not. So the first thing that we are showing is that uh, so-called gridlock equilibrium always exists. So this is a, a null equilibrium in a coordination games that we are very familiar with. Uh, it is always possible for consensus to fail. Nobody ever commits, no matter how many messages they are getting. This is an equilibrium. 
And uh, it's kind of surprising that we are not seeing more of those stalled uh, blockchains, but it is always possible. Uh, instead, of course, we are interested in the successful consensus uh, equilibria, where the messages are sent with some probability and there is some there are some commitment decisions. Um, so I'm going to focus on those uh, consensus uh, positive consensus equilibria. So every user, every uh, uh, every node, rational node who receives some k number of messages, can make certain inferences based on the number of messages that they received. So they know with what probability, with which probability. Uh, rational leader is going to send the message. They know uh, with what probability the backup nodes are going to be forwarding the messages, so know, knowing P and Q, and seeing the K messages that they receive, they can infer a uh, number of things. Number one is they can infer whether the leader is uh, rational or Byzantine. And this is because a rational leader in an equilibrium P and Q, if the leader is rational, the number of messages that the rational a backup node is uh, going to get will be restricted by this behavior of, uh, 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 consistent with P and Q. So at least they are going to get N minus F P times Q messages. So this is if all the Byzantine nodes decided not to forward the message. And at most, they are going to get N minus F P Q plus uh, F P messages. And this is when rational nodes behave as they are prescribed. But the, uh, all the Byzantine nodes are sending the, and forwarding messages for the one and not probability Q. So getting messages anywhere outside of this interval indicates naturally that the leader is uh, Byzantine. Getting messages within that interval means that the leader may be either Byzantine or rational. There's already some inference. Okay? In addition, in addition uh, a rational node can make inferences about uh, what number of uh, messages other rational nodes received, given I, that I received K. So I know that all the other rational nodes can get at least my number of messages minus F, or at most my number of messages plus F. So that kind of limits, not everything is possible. So this is what they get if the leader is Byzantine. And if the leader is rational, and I know that they are going to get messages within the same, the same interval, blue interval that is consistent with rational leader. Okay. So based on those inferences, uh, we can specify uh, the possible uh, intervals and possible, uh, uh, possible protocols that are going to lead to consensus. Okay. So number one thing is that if we have a consensus, uh, consensus uh, equilibrium, then uh, I am going to commit uh, only if I'm getting messages within the interval co consistent with a uh, rational, rational leader. And this is because if I know that the leader is Byzantine, I will not want to commit ever because I know that I will be getting minus C from committing in this worst case scenario world that I have, uh, that I have assumed. Um, so except for one, you know, one point that I'm not going to dwell on in the short presentation, but, uh, but we, we, we talk about it extensively in the paper. So uh, uh, the, the, the way, I mean, the reason why we never want to commit when the leader is, uh, the leader is uh, Byzantine is because no matter what we think we could have a number that we can coordinate on, like let's say everybody, if they get, uh, three messages they are going to commit, then the leader can always kind of uh, 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 always gang up against us, uh, Byzantine leader, and make sure that we are getting that number of messages and everybody else is getting a different number of messages. So by um, uh, the strategy of uh, iterated deletion of uh, dominated strategies, we are showing, I'm going to kind of short shortcut it here because uh, I don't think I have that much time to go uh, carefully over a proof, but um, basically can show that if we know that the leader is Byzantine, then we never really want to commit to, uh, commit to a message because uh, other, uh, other rational nodes are going to get a different number of messages. So uh, we know we are never going to get to commit to messages outside of this interval, but are we going to commit to message within the interval that is consistent with rational leader. And it turns out that we may or may not, but what is important that if we are going to 
commit to some part of this interval, we are going to commit in the in the whole in the whole interval. So we cannot be uh, we cannot have holes because again again the Byzantine backup nodes can gang up against us even if they are uh, even if they are uh, even if the leader is rational. So in the end, uh, we find that uh, that uh, either we are going to um, commit in this interval or not commit in this whole interval. And uh, like I said, we are showing that we always get this gridlock equilibrium where we never want to commit. But the question is, when are we going to get a good equilibrium where we actually do want to commit if we get messages in this interval? And it turns out that it crucially depends on the uh, reward, and, uh, re reward and penalty scheme. So this is why this incentivization of blockchains with uh, stake rewarding or with, uh, uh, or with other type of rewards or in permission blockchains with the penalty when, we, um, uh, uh, when, the, when, the, when something goes wrong with the, uh, with the consensus is really crucial, a crucial design element to achieve consensus. And we are characterizing exactly the conditions on the reward and the penalty that we need. Now, I know this is a busy slide, but I just want to kind of highlight certain things. I wanted to make sure that we have all equilibria in, in one slide for reference. So this is why it became so busy. So we show that uh, uh, aside of the gridlock equilibrium, we have two types of uh, good consensus equilibrium. One uh, consensus, one type of consensus equilibrium arises, we call it singleton E0 equilibria. Uh, this arises when the leader, rational leader, sends the message with probability one. So leader always sends messages to the backup nodes. So that allows the backup nodes to always infer from the number of messages that they got from the, from the leader, whether the leader is Byzantine or, or not. So especially Byzantine. So if they never got the message from the leader, they know for sure that the leader is Byzantine. And there, this, are, there are three minutes left, Hannah. Okay, I think this will be uh, this will be almost almost right, <laughs> almost enough. Um, and the other type of uh, of consensus equilibria, the interval E uh, zero equilibria, is when the leader sends a message to each backup with some probability that is uh, less than one, and it is within certain interval. And now, if the backup does not get a message from the leader, it is, it is still possible that leader is rational. So that uh, kind of changes the inference. And if it changes the inference, it changes the conditions on the payoffs that we need to offer to the, uh, to the, uh, to the nodes. So it turns out, and this is what I want to highlight here, is that the uh, requirement on R on the reward is much lower if we are going for the, uh, for the equilibrium uh, with, uh, with P1 than the requirement on the reward if we want to go for the other equilibrium where the leader sends the message with probability uh, less than one. Um, now, I'm not going to go into the, uh, the, the um, okay. I'm not going to go into the detail why this is the, the case, but I'm going to think about the consequences. So uh, when we have a protocol uh, that prescribes uh, certain behaviors, then uh, and given given certain punishments and rewards, then uh, we only are going to reach a consensus if this uh, if this protocol is incentive compatible. So if the conditions are met, so we can calculate the cost of incentives, and this is where we find that it is going to be cheaper to get the singleton in zero equilibrium than uh, than get the um, and then the interval, uh, interval E0 equilibria. And for interval, however, if we are forced to get interval E0 equilibria, the a P that is farther from one half requires higher reward. And now why would we care about it? Because if this is the case, we should always go for this great cheap equilibrium that is, uh, that is prescribing the leader to send a message with probability one. The problem is, that I'm going to skip that slide. The problem is that messages sometimes get lost. And the moment we have a loss of messages, our good chip equilibrium with singleton E0 
is disappearing and we are only left with the more expensive equilibria that require positive interval uh, for, uh, for the, for the uh, for, uh, positive interval of E0. So this is positive interval of messages that, uh, that uh, under which the backup nodes are going to commit even if they did not get a message from the leader. And then we need to prescribe the leader to send messages with lower probability than one so that they will get to the backup nodes with lower probability than let's say 0 0.99 in order to more cheaply incentivize those backup nodes to actually commit to messages. Because otherwise they will worry, worry that they, will, uh, they, they don't have the irrational leader and they will not commit messages and, we, and will not get consensus, okay? So uh, this, is, uh, this is my last slide, so I may be almost on time. So why does it all matter, right? I, I, I took you on this trip of uh, you know, quite theoretical, uh, theoretical model uh, of a consensus mechanism, uh, bringing elements from CS and elements from, from economics. And this is because uh, operational success of any blockchain uh, depends on its design. And it is true for proof of stake, for permission, permissionless blockchains, and you know, of course, for proof of work as well. But if we want to use Byzantine fault tolerant consensus protocols, which we actually are doing in many of the permissioned and proof of stake permissionless blockchains, then we should account for incentives of uh, Byzantine fault tolerant uh, uh, for tolerance. Then uh, we need to remember that all uh, designs will be subject to multiple equilibria concerns, and we may get the we should worry about the grid, gridlock equilibrium, and uh, some even small probability of message loss will significantly affect uh, equilibria. So our model provides a guidelines guidance on cost of incentives needed to achieve consensus depending on the on the design, and we are showing that it is less costly when protocol may ask for sending messages with probability one half than asking to send messages with, 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 uh, uh, with one, probability one. And this is different recommendation from traditional Byzantine fault tolerance prescriptions. So in the end, we need to think more carefully about incentives because they are going to really affect the cost of running those new systems as we're building them more and more. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hannah. The discussant for the paper is uh, Cyril Monet. He is a professor of economics at the University of Bern. He also has a former life as a central banker. He was at the Federal Reserve Philadelphia, Minneapolis, at the ECB, and he also was an advisor to the Swiss National Bank. So, Cyril, the floor is yours. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Thomas. <clears throat> um, so, let me jump right in because I don't have much time. So, you know, the question that uh, the, uh, the authors uh, want to answer is essentially how to reach consensus in distributed ledgers, but not in any distributed ledgers, okay? It's when agents are utility maximizing, okay? The, the agents that have to reach consensus, they, they are honest, some of them, but they also want to maximize their utility. And this is the main difference from the usual uh, consensus uh, literature that you find in computer science that computer scientists don't care about utility maximization or some of them don't um, and you know the issue there is that uh, others agents that uh, will want to jeopardize the system so th th they are going to be the byzantines here and uh, they will sort of seek to uh, pretend to be honest but you know at the end they won't be so, you know, the question then is, given these bad guys, uh, how do you reach consensus? So what is consensus here? So consensus uh, it has the following definition. So consensus is achieved when all honest agents, they commit to a block, okay? So when a block is submitted on a blockchain, uh, the honest guys have to commit to it. And if all honest agents commit, then we say that we reach consensus. So the, the authors, the, the, and Anna presented the model, so it's pretty simple model. I mean, the, the model is essentially on this slide. So this means that, you know, it's always a good uh, model in the sense that it's very simple when you can present a model on uh, a single slide. And this is what, uh, you know, we should aim for as theorists. So I think that, you know, sums up for that. 
Um, so the, the, the setup is the following. So you have a continuum of honest agents. So N minus F, you have a continuum F of Byzantine agents. And one of these agents is gonna be selected as a leader. And the leader here is going to suggest a block to the other agents. So agents who received the block can also send that block you know, to other agents. Okay, so there's gonna be a round of communication. And then people or agents are gonna count the, the amount of messages that they received. Okay? So given the number of messages received, the question is gonna be as an honest guy, should I uh, accept or should I commit the block in my local blockchain or not? Now, what's my payoff? So if I commit and all other honest agents do, then I'm gonna get R. Uh, if I commit, but some other honest agents do not, then I'm gonna be punished and I'm gonna get minus C. Uh, if I don't commit, you know, whatever, irrespective of what other people do, I get zero, okay? So here, I mean, it's pretty easy to see that I'd better commit if I think that everybody else commit, otherwise I'm gonna get this minus C. Okay, so that's the, the, the simpler, the, the simple setup here. And I'm going to go through a simpler setup. And I don't know if it's simpler, but it was simpler to me. Um, so, and it's gonna be to replace the continuum uh, of agents by a finite number of agents. Okay, so now you should think of it as there's a finite number of honest agents and a finite number of Byzantine agents. It's simpler because then we don't enter into this measure theoretic uh, issues. Um, I'm going to also make it simpler because I'm only going to first consider when uh, this this problem when there is only one round of message. Okay, so essentially a leader is selected, and this leader has to send messages, and then people have to say, should I commit or not? Okay, and that's it. So there's no second round of communication. So here is uh, the, how it plays out. So here you have some honest guys. So these are the black, the, the black uh, figures here. And then you have some Byzantine um, uh, agents. These are the red uh, figures here. Okay, so suppose that here you have one honest leader that is selected and the guy is going to communicate uh, to these agents a block. So to reach consensus, you know, it has to be that this leader sends the block to everybody. The leader, this honest agent here, doesn't care if agents who receive that blocks are Byzantine or honest, you know, but this leader wants the honest guy to receive this message. So the honest leader will have to send the same message to all these agents. So that's what uh, the honest leader will do. Knowing that the leader is honest, the uh, honest agents, they expect that everybody else received this message. And therefore, then uh, there's going to be two equilibrium, one where they commit to the block, and then they receive a payoff R, and one when they don't, okay, and then they get zero. Okay, so why would, wouldn't they commit? Well, because they expect at least one other agent not to commit and therefore it's optimal for them not to commit. So you always have this gridlock equilibrium, uh, which the computing literature, uh, they don't have because they always, they always assume that agents behave because they don't have these incentive issues. But here we will always have this gridlock equilibrium. Okay, so this is when you know that the leader is honest. Now suppose that the leader is Byzantine. Okay, so if the leader is Byzantine, um, what happens is that the Byzantine leader will seek to impose damage, uh, so to speak, on the, on the system. So the maximum damage here is going to be imposed when the Byzantine leader sends a block to all but one honest agent. Okay, why? Because this honest agent here, he doesn't know what the block is, so he cannot agree on the block and he cannot add it on the blockchain, on his local blockchain. Okay, so given the definition of consensus, which was that all honest agents have to commit, you know, even if all the honest agents who receive the information commit, you won't have consensus because of this lone uh, guy here. Okay, so now the problem is, you know, these, uh, these honest agents who receive the information, of course, they don't know if, oops, if the leader is honest or not. 
And nature is actually going to, to uh, select uh, the leader randomly, okay? So the probability that the leader is honest is gonna be the fraction of honest agents in this economy. The probability that the leader is Byzantine is gonna be the fraction of Byzantine agents in this economy. Now, in terms of expected payoff, you know, you know that if the, the leader is honest, you will reach consensus and you will get R. You know that if the leader is Byzantine, you won't and you will get punished by minus C. So at the end of the day, you commit if your expected payoff is positive. Okay, so this was the, the condition that Anna was showing in the E0 equilibrium, I think, or I forgot. Anyway, so this is also their expected payoff from actually committing. Okay, so here you can see that uh, agents will commit only if the reward they get uh, from committing is high enough. Okay, now the question is, can we do better? Okay, so that's, that's pretty good. We can reach consensus, but some of the time the consensus is not going to be good because uh, actually we don't reach consensus uh, some of the time. And the issue is by adding a layer of communication, can we do better than that in terms of expected payoff? So this is what um, this slide is about. So here, suppose that, so we already know that if the leader is honest, you know, you achieve consensus. Now, suppose that the leader is Byzantine. Okay, so you have this lone guy here, the blue guy, who didn't get any information. Now you need to reach this guy. So how do you do it? Well, by adding another layer of communication, you can ask all the agents to again send uh, the blog that they received from the leader. Okay, if all send, so the honest leader here, it's as if they become a leader in the second stage. They each become a leader. And so their optimal strategy is just to send that block to everybody else, because then the blue guy becomes informed. So if the, if the blue guy becomes informed about the block, um, you know, all the honest guys, the, the black guys here, they will expect that everybody got the information uh, about the block. And then it's an optimal strategy for them. I mean, you always have the gridlock equilibrium, but it's, it's also an equilibrium to commit, okay? So given this, you know, what is the best strategy for the Byzantine leader the best that wants to minimize the payoff of the honest agents? Here, the best strategy is not to submit any block, okay? So if the, if the leader is Byzantine, the Byzantine leader knows that by sending a block, everybody will become informed about that block. And so the, 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 leader, the Byzantine leader is gonna say, well, you know, if I want to minimize the payoff of these agents, I'd better send nothing. But if the uh, Byzantine leader doesn't send anything, then uh, you know, these agents, they get zero as a payoff. So the expected payoff in this economy for these honest agents then is just the probability that the leader is honest and then they get the reward of, consen of reaching consensus. And when the leader is Byzantine, then they get zero. But as you can see, now the payoff is higher than before when you had only one round of communication. So here communication is helping quite a lot. And it's helping because it forces the Byzantine leader to stay quiet, okay? And not to sort of screw up the system. You have three um, minutes left, Cyril. Yeah, thank you. Um, so this was on 10 minutes or 15 minutes? On 15. Oh my God. <laughs> um, so, you know, if you have multiple messages, that actually doesn't affect the result. Uh, the reason, and I'm going to skip that slide. I can come back to it if you, if you want later on. Um, now, what affects the result if the failure to deliver messages? Okay, so Anna talked about um, uh, message fails. And so it's essentially that when a leader co uh, communicates a block, it only reaches a node with priority pi. Okay, so here, since there is n minus f uh, honest leaders, the probability that they all become informed is gonna be given by pi to the power n minus f, okay? Um, now, with a Byzantine leader here, you know, the Byzantine leader might want to inflict maximum damage on the, uh, on the system. And you know, I'm I'm going to assume that here the honest lead, the Byzantine leader sends up to only one honest guy. I mean, now the honest guy is going to send the message to everybody else. And again, the probability that it reaches everybody else is going to be n minus f minus one. 
so at the end of the day, what you get is that agents commit whenever the probability, I mean, whenever there's a sufficiently high probability that uh, they can reach consensus. So again, this is the probability of reaching consensus that the message gets to everybody. Um, and this is the probability that it doesn't get to anybody. And this actually is interesting. What's interesting here is that this effect that the message doesn't reach anybody also appears when the leader is honest, okay? So you always get that uh, here. Um, now, as you can see here, as the number of honest agents increase, you know, you need to increase the reward uh, so that agents commit uh, like, you know, more than proportionately. So actually R, the reward is becoming a convex function of the number of honest agents. Okay, so this means that um, as, you know, the distributed ledger is uh, acquired or updated by more and more agents in the economy, uh, the higher and the higher the reward has to become. Okay, so what are the, the key takeaways uh, from all this? And actually, you know, this is Anna's paper. So uh, from Anna's paper, so the one thing is that there always exists a gridlock equilibrium, um, and that's new. Uh, layers, so more layers of communication help consensus, and I think that's, that's quite important. Um, more distribution, which means a higher number of agents, implies that there should be more communication, and that actually makes it even more difficult to achieve consensus when there is message fails. And, uh, you know, so you should have higher rewards as faults become increasingly likely. And I think that's, that's interesting. So basically, the fact that, you know, the reward function is convex also is quite interesting because it means that as more and more people participate, the higher and the higher the reward has to become. And this is convex, it's not linear. Uh, final remark. So, you know, the I, I didn't do, uh, you know, I didn't do credit to, you know, the paper in the sense that, uh, I mean, the technicality in the paper, they are really nice. And I allowed the paper for characterizing all symmetric equilibria. That's really nice. Um, the, there is a very nice proof using iterated deletion of the mediated strategies. Uh, I re really recommend reading it. Uh, now, I'm wondering if this could be simplified by determining the objective of the honest leader. Okay, in particular, um, the honest leader has a first mover advantage. And so it should be possible to actually, you know, by, by really specifying what the objective of this guy is, uh, you know, to, to determine what he's going to do. I mean, in particular, it seems to me that, you know, the best, and, you know, this is sort of what Anna was, was referring to, the best strategy of this guy is always to communicate the block to everybody. Okay, so to choose P equal one. Um, okay, then let me skip this one. Um, so one, I think, important remark is that here, consensus is on anything. Okay, so it's like, that's what I call an anything goes consensus in the sense that you want to reach consensus on whatever information is, is sent by the leader. Uh, but it seems to me that, you know, you want the, the content of the message to be correct. In particular, you don't want, for instance, a block to, to, to have like a double spend uh, transaction. Uh, so consensus on a wrong information might jeopardize the whole system. So what I, you know, the way I read the paper is really as a benchmark paper where, you know, we want to reach consensus on information. The next step should be reaching consensus, but on the right information. And, you know, we know that, I mean, or I know that it's hard to do. Um, so I have a recent paper with Rod Garrett where we actually show that reaching uh, truth telling in a decentralized setting is, we call it impossible. Uh, so, you know, it's hard to reach uh, consensus on the truth. So it's sort of, um, I'm gonna wave my hand, it's sort of easy to reach consensus. Anna's paper show it's not easy at all, okay? Uh, but the next step is to reach consensus on the truth. Um, last slide, um, I, I was wondering if adding communication rounds would help, okay? Because here you only have one communication, you have two communication rounds. And I'm wondering if, you know, adding one more uh, helps in any way. I mean, given you have a continuum, a continuum of agents, I'm wondering if that's really 
helping with a discrete finite number of agents it might help and it might actually help to go sequential um anyway so i'm wondering about that um now the other question is your the notion of consensus you use is very strong right is that every honest agents have to agree and i'm just wondering you know if you have 99 percent of honest agent agreeing would that be enough for the system to be viable um you know in the long run maybe it's not and then it would be a very interesting result to have um final word on the last slide is that you know to me this is a must read paper on consensus on distributed ledger uh, it provides a really interesting benchmark uh, for future studies uh, so if you're interested in that you should definitely read it and thanks for giving me more time <laughs> thank you very much uh, Cyril Hannah would you like to respond to to Cyril's comments so, our, first of all, thank you very much for, uh, for fantastic comments. It's a, it may be a very good in illustrative example for us to use, even in the paper, to use this uh, discrete, uh, uh, discrete number, of, uh, number of users um, uh, to, to kind of show what, uh, what, what's going on. Uh, and, and I would say that, you know, the things that you are wondering about, uh, the, the, the one before the, in the last slide, we're also wondering about. So will the uh, more, number, more rounds of communication, would it help? Um, and it may not necessarily, as you're pointing out, with continuum of, of, uh, of agents. But uh, you pointed out that, you know, what if we have only 99% uh, consensus? So we were following computer scientific literature, which were saying, like, we only care if everybody, everybody agrees. And if you think about, you know, potential use of blockchain for interbanking system, we don't really want, you know, 99%, uh, you know, 1% chance that we are getting forks and one bank has a different ledger than everybody else, right? We don't want to run into this problem and we are only going to think about systems that are going to give us this 100% guarantee. But what happens is that if we combine this, what if we get 99% consensus in one round, but now we have multiple rounds of communication, we can iron it out. So we can, we can actually combine those two, even with continuum of, uh, of, of users. So, so this is the, uh, this is, uh, uh, we, are, we, are, we are thinking and wondering uh, exactly along the same, uh, the same ways. I wanted to kind of comment also on this um, truth in blockchain. Uh, so right from the beginning, when we were thinking about the proof of work uh, blockchains, uh, there wasn't really a notion of truth. The reason why we have longest chain attacks is because as long as majority of the, uh, of the network uh, agrees on something, this becomes truth. And this is why you can override the history as long as we, all, we you know, majority of us agrees to overrun it. And uh, the same thing may happen in proof of stake and in, in other situations uh, as well. So uh, this, uh, I, you know, I, I will, I want to very much read the, your paper with, uh, with Rod. Um, but the idea of uh, having blockchain being also the source of, source of true is actually going back to a very philosophical problem of how do we know that a given sentence is true? We need to have external uh, Oracle to do that, and we know even in blockchain world that once we start dealing with Oracle, we we enter in you know a, a whole new realm of problems. Uh, so this is also the case the case here. So like you said, we are just focusing on even reaching consensus on just any message that is uh, that is problematic. So overall, thank you very much for the uh, for both the. Uh, you know, the comments, the clarification, the example, and, uh, you know, thinking along the same lines about the future questions. So thank you. Let's see if there are questions or comments from the audience. And we have a number of panelists who can unmute and uh, speak. All the others can use the Q&A area to post questions or comments. So who I wants guess to start? Yeah. I have a, a question which is related, I think, to Cyril's idea of, of truth. But uh, if you're thinking of a, of a Byzantine leader who is trying to do the maximum damage, um, you assume that maximum damage means not reaching consensus. But I think Cyril implicitly was saying maximum damage could be re re reaching consensus on the wrong thing. So that's not exactly how he phrased his comment. But I was wondering if you thought about this and, and how that would complicate your analysis. I imagine you haven't considered it because it would just complicate things a lot, but, but I would be interested in any thoughts you have. Well, I mean, 
I haven't thought, we haven't thought about it, you know, to put it in the paper, but definitely we have thought about it uh, in the in, in general context. So, uh, you know, one thing is, uh, what would be this damage on a wrong, uh, you know, consensus on the wrong message? So uh, Cyril said, well, how about double spend? This we can actually mechanically exclude because double spend transactions will raise red flags and those are not considered to be committable messages to the existing uh, to existing uh, to existing blockchain so this would not work so basically let's say we have two conflicting uh, two conflicting transactions i'm sending money to cyril and i'm sending money to russ and you know one of them gets into the blockchain and the other one is deemed invalid automatically so if i am this byzantine uh, agent I'm sending money to, to Cyril and then I'm in cahoots with Russ. So I'm actually trying to get the, the, uh, the, the first transaction that the, the, you know, the transaction that's more favorable to me on the blockchain first, right? Um, so is this the, you know, is this the maximum damage? Uh, if this is the maximum damage that we already have rules of blockchains that are preventing that. So only if Cyril sees the, uh, the transaction on the blockchain, then he gives me the bicycle that I was buying and not before. And because he sees it on the blockchain, it means that the transaction, you know, where I'm sending the same money to us did not go in because it would be conflicting. So there is, uh, the question is how much damage can be done by putting in the wrong message. I think there may be more of this damage done in more permissioned uh, settings. Uh, where we don't have enough safeguards already against this. Are there other questions? Then let me ask something, Hannah. In the as you mentioned, this is a very uh, old classic uh, problem in computer science, and the solution back then to the Byzantine general problem uh, was exactly about the proportion that you had between Byzantine notes and uh, honest notes. So how does that work in your, in your model? The, you know, the, the, the proportion, what would happen if you would exclude all Byzantine notes and kind of do a Satoshi thing and say, everyone is rational? Uh, well, so, so, okay, so we say uh, our rational notes have ambiguity, are ambiguity averse to the strategies of Byzantine notes. The way to interpret it is that, well, everybody may be rational. It's just for nodes that we call irrational, they are maximizing their payoffs within the system. And Byzantine nodes maximize their payoffs that may come from wherever. It may be, you know, I may be a hacker who wants to bring down the system, or I may be, a, uh, you know, an aspiring hacker who wants to show ability to get into a group of hackers to do something else, right? We don't know what their objectives are. And therefore, we are not uh, looking at the strategies that are uh, that are maximizing their payoffs. But yes, we can clearly say that they are they are maximizing maximizing payoffs, and they are rational. It's just not everybody is only not everybody's objective is solely included in the in the uh, in the protocol, right? So this is uh, now the when the, the question of uh, the number of Byzantine nodes, so nodes who would have. Uh, objectives that may be outside of the protocol, uh, we have uh, in our formulas, so all our formulas are affected by this number F, both N and F and the difference. And uh, that means that given the, the number of the expectations of, the, of, the, uh, of how many Byzantine uh, nodes we have, the range of where do we commit for, or where do we commit the new batch of uh, transactions to the ledger is going to change. Thank you. I saw Dirk had his hands up. Yeah, do we, if you still have a second or so. I, I was wondering, I'm not sure whether I fully understood that the pi factor, so the probability that the message um, is, is sort of corrupted. Could, could it help in that context that you sort of um, partition the set of the recipients, let them individually, each of the individual groups, um, coordinate on what signal they thought they have received and then later on re-aggregate sort of the signal rather than having everybody receive the signal and go into the second round. Is, is that a way to sort of deal with this convexity that you can sort of 
structure the set of the recipients and they're re-communicating in a different way than doing it linearly across everybody. I'm not sure whether I'm clear in trying to phrase what I have in mind. I guess it's a question more to Cyril than, uh, than, than but I, I guess, so, so the idea is that it is a peer-to-peer -peer network and you are forwarding messages to other users, um, or you're signing the messages. Uh, so, so in a way, everybody with some probability is going to get a message from you. You could potentially say, oh, I got a message from you that you got this message and I didn't get it from, you know, from the other node. So let us communicate and, and figure out. Uh, potentially, yes. I'm not sure whether this is actually going to be, aside of the fact that it's going to increase the number of messages and latency of making any decision. It's not clear whether it actually is going to make a difference because in the end when you are going to aggregate it it's going the aggregation will depend on the relative weights of this uh, of the system uh, of the of the two groups Dirk, if so. i understand your comments the the message loss is idiosyncratic so in proportion there's always some people get in the message some people do not and then in the second round you just mix it again so in some sense that i think it's it's it's, it's addressing your question but, but, yeah but, but i think you go the uh, in example that cyril uh provided which was in discrete world there were there was always possibility oh, yeah. that yeah. uh some fraction is not getting message at all and this is what gave the convexity oh i see in your model that's not there and in the in the continuum model it's not happening because in continuum model uh when we have continuum all large number of nodes or large number of rounds the probability that that somebody did not get any messages just due to the compounded loss uh, is going to zero. I see. Okay, thank you. We still have time for one or two questions, given that we gave more time to the discussant. So, so if there's time, I'll, I'll ask a question. So, the the assumption of the ambiguity aversion um, seems kind of strong. You know, for example, I, I thinking about Cyril's first example, if I got a message, you know, and I'm thinking either it's an honest leader and we all got the message, or it's a Byzantine leader and I was selected into, you know, I was the one who was chosen to receive the message and I have to think about how likely those are. And, you know, sort of if I started as a Bayesian and there are a large number of people, I'm going to think it's very likely the honest leader. Um, but if I'm ambiguity averse, then I, I act as if it's the Byzantine leader. So in that sense, it feels strong. And I'm just wondering, is it possible to move away from that and sort of be more Bayesian? And are, are there ways to do that? And would it change things? Uh, yes. Uh, so yes, and possibly, uh, depending on which of the questions I'm, of your questions I'm answering. So uh, yes, it is possible to move away from it. So let me start with justification why we started with that assumption. This is an assumption that is taken directly from uh, CS literature and the, uh, and the assumption that is, um, uh, that, that is used in CS, that we always take the worst case scenario for the, for the Byzantine leader for the Byzantine nodes, because it may be one attacker that hacked all the nodes uh, potentially, but we actually don't know what they, what they would be doing. So this is why this worst case scenario assumption, uh, we have worst case scenario assumption. Uh, and, uh, and it is, you know, because it's strong, it kind of gives us the strongest possible uh, conditions on the equilibrium. If those are satisfied, then we are, we are in good shape. Um, now, uh, is it possible to step away? It is possible to step away, but the model, in fact, becomes much more complicated. It um, becomes much more complicated because now, and a little bit more shaky in a way, because now we need to make assumptions about what the Byzantine leader wants. And, and guessing what the attacker wants, it's, it's just, you know, it's always um, um, shaky and uncertain. Do they want to really, de you know, destabilize the system and, and destroy it? Do they want to just destabilize the system to show their power and therefore extract some rent? Uh, do they want to, and, and so on. Now, even if we assume are just one particular uh, objective, then we are getting into uh, multiple, multiple strategies that may, uh, that may, that may um, 
uh, work just as well for the Byzantine note. We are getting into mixed strategy equilibria, and then we are getting into a much larger set of potential uh, potential equilibria characterizations. Yeah, I see. Thanks. But in a way, we are all working on it. So this is why I, you know, I can give you this answer with a little bit more detail, if you want. Any other questions? We have one in the Q&A box that goes way beyond your paper. And basically it asks about the use cases for, uh, for DLT, including, I don't know whether you want to take, <laughs> whether you want to take a stab at it or leave that up to your fellow central bankers. Well, it's a, uh, so I'm, what are the, what, uh, what will be the future business uses, use cases in order to add value? So, uh, well, I, let, me, let me say that, uh, you know, we, we're asking this question, we know far more about technology and about potential um, ways in trying to implement it than we know about the potential benefits of implementing it, which I think is pretty bizarre. And uh, the questions, why, why would we still need it uh, are, are popping up all over the place, even though we are actively implementing and, and, uh, and designing those systems. And, you know, the idea of having a shared ledger that is allowing for, um, you know, immediate settlement, not immediate settlement, but the thing is like the, it, it's removing the need to coordinate individual ledgers, having a system that kind of by design coordinates those, those individual led, ledgers uh, by a protocol is very enticing, right? So this is why we keep thinking of interbank settlement layer or uh, any supply chain layer, any anywhere where, where we constantly sending, are sending messages in order to reconcile individual ledgers. This is exactly what the consensus mechanism is doing. It's setting up everyone on a joint system so that we automatically are reconciling our individual ledgers, right? This is where we get consensus when we all have the same ledger. So, uh, so I think that there are a lot of, uh, you know, it kind of is going to distributed ledger systems are going to get and become this middle layer uh, in, in, the use, in the use cases where the end users will not care anymore the same way that we don't care anymore about internet because internet is everywhere and it makes communication easier, but it definitely has a lot of, a lot of impact. But this kind of, I think that the, the ease of reconciling individual ledgers will have a lot of uses. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Hannah. Thanks, Cyril. Let me hand back to you, Jonathan. Um, thank you again to Thomas, um, Hannah, and Cyril for the very informative and thought-provoking discussion, and to all of you for participating today. Um, we hope you will join us again next week for the CEPR webinar and next month for the Job Market Candidate Workshop. Uh, until then, I hope you have a pleasant day and a nice weekend. Thank See you. you.